This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. U.S. politics in the 2012 elections, competing visions of America and the American dream, a progressive policy and political agenda, income inequality and tax fairness, the Affordable Care Act, contraception politics and the Republican Party, all on City Talk. Joining us today to survey the terrain of current and possible future U.S. politics is Neera Tandon. Neera is the president of the Center for American Progress. She was appointed its president in November 2011, having served as its chief operating officer. Neera has worked in the Obama and Clinton administrations, serving as senior advisor for health reform at the Department of Health and Human Services, and as a member of the Obama health reform team. Nero was also policy director for Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign, among other political activities. Welcome. Great to be with you. Thank you. Oh, for it's, me. It's, it's a real pleasure. Before we talk about current politics, mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about you and the center. Talk about your personal bio and how it structured your professional life. Oh, well, I, you know, I grew up in a small town in Massachusetts, Bedford, Massachusetts. Uh, my parents got divorced uh, early, at an early age, when I was five. Um, and so, uh, you know, which is unusual, I had Indian parents uh, who got divorced uh, in 1975. Now I've aged myself. Uh, but the, uh, and my father uh, left for a few years, uh, and my mother, uh, who'd never worked a day in her life, had to go on welfare. Uh, and she, you know, she faced a very stark choice between uh, going on welfare in the United States or going back to India. And if she had gone back to India, she would have been the uh, only woman she knew of who'd been divorced. And as you can imagine, that would have limited my life choices in India. So she chose to stay in the United States. She was on welfare for a few years. Uh, and then she got a job as a travel agent at an Indian travel agent office uh, in Waltham, Massachusetts. And a few years after that, she I uh, got a job at Raytheon doing as a travel agent, and then a few years after that, she became a contracts administrator at Raytheon. And a few years, you know, about six or seven years after we were on welfare, she was able to buy her own house in Bedford, Massachusetts, with good public schools. Um, and, you know, so I really think of uh, these, you know, when people attack government programs and say, you know, government doesn't do anything, you know, I really think about my own life experience and how I was able to have the, you know, success I've had in my life because those programs existed to ensure that, you know, I, I didn't fall behind, but I could continue. How did you, in a sense, your bio affect your motivations in professional life? Well, I, you know, I've always uh, been interested in policy and politics because I understand uh, why, why, like, how these things matter in people's lives. Mm -hmm. And so... I started following politics when I was in high school. Uh, I will say, I, for a year or two there, I was a Reagan supporter early on <laughs> when I was in school. And, and, and what was your epiphany? <laughs> and then my, it's actually funny, my mother, when I was, I started like being a Reagan supporter, I think when I was 11 or 12, right when he came into office. And then when I was 13 or 14, my mother explained to me that Reagan was for life. And, you know, I was a, you know, sort of strong-minded teenage girl, and so I was very pro-choice at the time, and so uh, that, that, that led to the, like, like my parting of the ways with the Republican Party. And when I first got to, went to college, I started, uh, started working as a precinct leader on the Dukakis campaign and have been active in politics ever since. And, and some very important <laughs> position. I mean, you've had nice life so far. Let's, <sighs> let's hope, you know, your activity is as successful in the future. Talk about the Center for American Progress for a bit. Uh, well, the Center for American Progress is a uh, multifaceted think tank. Uh, it's uh, started in 2003. John Podesta was our president for eight years. He's now chairman of the board. 
Uh, you know, in Washington, there have been a, a variety of center and center right think tanks, a American Enterprise Institute, Heritage, Cato, all of which, sure. uh, you know, all of which have a philosophy and ideology that's conservative. And there had been no think tank on the center left that really works on issues across the stream. There's particular groups that work on the economy or education, but no Grew, no organization, no think tank that was working across the spectrum. So CAP has a national security team, an economic policy team, and a domestic policy team, and we also spend a f significant resources and communications in order to communicate our ideas. And we have a very active blog, Think Progress, which uh, according to Technorati, I believe is the fifth most influential blog in the world, gets cited a tremendous amount um, by mainstream media and other, and other outlets. And uh, we have, we're very active in social media uh, and new ways of communicating because we've always thought that what's important and what the right has really done is not only invest in ideas but invest in communicating their ideas effectively. And so that's an important marriage for CAP and we've been really proud of the success we've had over, over a short time. You know, we're a relatively young institution. How big are you? We're around 240 people um, now, a significant budget uh, and, you know, we've uh, we count our success not in our staff, et cetera, but in our ability to influence policy. And our goal has always been to uh, affect the debate, but not only affect the debate, but to actually change America through our ideas. And okay. So <laughs> what then are the priorities of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party as articulated by CAP? Well, I mean, the, the primary challenge the country faces, and therefore... You know, we always look to see, you know, we, we are actually trying to solve the country's challenges. Um, the primary, you know, the primary challenge we face as a country is how to create growth in our economy that's more broadly shared than it's been in the past. So, you know, in the last several years, we've faced tremendous inequality. And, you know, in 2010, 93% of the income growth in the country went to the top 1%. That is a stark figure. Uh, and I think as a nation, we have to ensure that we have economic growth because that is fundamental not only to, you know, everyone's well-being but to our democracy. But we, also fundamental to our democracy is ensuring that we have growth that builds a strong and stable middle class. And, you know, I think a lot of the debates in Washington get hidden behind, you know, partisan, partisan snippets, et cetera. But what's really at stake on our budget battles, our tax battles that are happening today is whether the government works on behalf of an elite few um, and leaves everyone else sort of on their own to get by or whether we have investments and support in a middle class that is strong and stable and ensures that the wealthy and well-to-do um, pay their fair share. Talk about specific policy agenda of CAP, mm -hmm. both in 2012 and looking forward. Well, just, you know, our, our most important work that we've done so far and what we want to replicate going into the future is when we work on longer term, bigger ideas that help shape the debate. So what we're particularly proud of um, is our work on health care. You know, in 2005, when no one in, uh, no one in the Democratic Party was talking about universal health care, CAP put forward a plan uh, to get to universal or near universal coverage that relied on, you know, mar new insurance markets, subsidies for people to be able to afford it, and strong insurance regulations. And that became the heart of what Obama, President, then Senator Obama, then Senator Clinton, and then Senator Edwards all put forward in the, in the 2007 primary. And as you know, President Obama led uh, and, if, and tried to get through, you know, pass the Affordable Care Act. So the CAP idea was a framework for that plan. And, and this, that's and this idea <laughs> and its fruition is now being considered by the august justices of the Supreme yes, Court. Yes, and as I like to point out to people, we had thousands upon thousands of hours of testimony, deliberation in the Congress about the Affordable Care Act, and we have three days by which the Supreme Court or five justices could overturn it, but that is, <laughs> that is a separate separate issue. And another area is, you know, what we're... we're is it really a separate issue when you talk about the nexus between politics, policy, and economics? what the court no, can yeah, absolutely. and must. No, Ab absolutely. I mean, I think the big issue for the Supreme Court is that we have gone through almost 100 years, really 80 years, where the Supreme Court has had a, de a deference towards elected branches on, on issues of 
economic activity, commerce, et cetera. We went through in the previous era, you know, as you know, there was what was called what we called the Lochner era, where we had an activist Supreme Court using the Commerce Clause to deny both the federal government and states the ability to regulate the economy um, on, you know, radical ideas like child labor laws, et right. cetera. And so, um, you know, I my own view is if the Supreme Court overturns the individual mandate, it will be returning to the Lochner era and reinvesting in this notion of, uh, you know, really, frankly, a made-up notion of <laughs> limited powers. They will be creating new precedents. If you look through everything we've talked about, there's no precedent that they cite to overturn the individual mandate. But does that matter? They ignored precedent in the Bush versus Gore decision and looked at what the Florida legislature had decided and said, nah, no way. Is this court a court that one could expect to be nonpartisan? You know, we have had 200 years where people have accepted the Supreme Court because, uh, because even when they get to the place where they are becoming, um, you know, more powerful than elected branches, they step back. So my hope is that the Supreme Court will recognize the unprecedented uh, action it would be taking. And when I say unprecedented, I literally mean unprecedented. There is no precedent for them to use to strike down the individual mandate. That's your hope. <laughs> what about your expectation? You know, actually, if you look through the testimony, if you look through the court proceedings, um, you know, I think reporters got particularly focused on Scalia's very aggressive questioning. If you actually look at what um, Justice Kennedy said in the second day of hearings on the individual mandate, you know, he he basically seemed to indicate that there should be a stronger standard for the individual mandate, but then also articulated a rationale by which it would meet that stronger standard. So, not to get too into legal jargon, but I expect him to, um, my own view is, you know, I expect him to uphold the individual mandate. And I, it could possibly be a 6-3 decision because I don't think Justice Roberts will want to be in the minority. So, you know, I, my expectation is still that the court will grapple with the kind of radical notion of what it's, it's, it's unleashing. You know, this idea is, uh, was considered radical just a few years ago, and that's part of what the right has done successfully. They take ideas that are outside the mainstream and move them into the mainstream, and that's why it's important for organizations like CAP to be a bulwark, because, you know, every, every day we're fighting a war of ideas, and uh, it's important for us to get progressive ideas out there as well. Okay, let's, let's move more specifically to the 2012 elections, mm -hmm. since in a sense, CAP is, you know, the Democrats think tank. Well, we are a 501c3. No, no, I understand, I know, I understand, <laughs> I know, I understand <laughs> that. I understand everybody. that, no, 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 I, I, I probably should phrase that. They, they are, you know, more in tune with the think, general thinking of the Democratic Party. Is that better? Well, I guess we're we're a five hundred one c three, so we put out ideas. Okay, I, I, I take it. Take I take them. it all back. I take it all back. <laughs> so we take. I take it all back. Can take them. Talk about your assessment of Democratic Party prospects in the upcoming election, both at the presidential level, having mm -hmm. worked for the president, mm -hmm. as well as at the Senate and House levels. What what are your expectations for the election? What do you see as mm -hmm. the defining issues? Uh, you know, I think we have crystallized the debate between the parties on economic issues and who stands, you know, who's, who is standing more for the middle class. That is the central question. And that, I believe, has helped the president's position over the last several, several months. He has become a, you know, stronger champion and advocate and fighter for the middle class. And, you know, in, he's really been drawing out the contrast with, Representative Ryan with uh, Mitt Romney around their different economic visions. And I believe that will be the central question. And to the extent the president is able to demonstrate who Mitt Romney stands for and with, um, and who he stands for and with, uh, I think you can, you'll, that, con that contrast will help the president. And, you know, it's, we went through the first year of, we went through 2011 which where the president was most f more focused on austerity. Uh, and I think that really and hurt. And a mistake? I really think that hurt the president and obviously hurt many uh, progressives. And I think the challenge for the president is to have 
an agenda that focuses on growth where he's really showing that he's the champion of middle class jobs and um, and rebuilding the middle class because I, you know it's it's not wrong for people to feel like the middle class is a little bit under assault if you look at where growth has been where uh, you know the lack of jobs while we have tremendous corporate profits and you know we all applaud corporate profits I'm not I want to say as a progressive we champion economic growth policies but we have to also ensure that growth doesn't come at any cost that growth helps helps actually build a middle class that uh, that builds demand what about the Senate and the house uh, you know I think the I actually think the house uh, we're gonna I should say we Democrats are likely to pick up a bunch of seats I worked at the DCCC uh, for one cycle and uh, you know, I think that, you know, in any wave election, you bring, a, you bring, which 2010 was a wave election for Republicans, no doubt about it. You bring a lot of people over who, who, you know, aren't particularly good members. And I think you'll see a lot of Tea Party members lose. But I also think, you know, Democrats are, uh, have helped crystallize this argument in a way that's very helpful to them. And in the Senate, it's, you know, it's a, it's a really 50-50 proposition, although they have a lot of candidates who are doing very well. Elizabeth Warren, you know, just reported really high fundraising numbers yesterday or the day before. Um, she's doing well. That will be very competitive, uh, and she may be behind really until the end. And then we have a bunch of incumbent Demo people who are doing well, and then, you know, we have, uh, uh, there is the whole main race, and I think that, um, you know, that race could really mean the balance shift towards Democrats the snow race. if, 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 if Angus King actually caucuses with Democrats. Okay, talk about on, what is it, January 21st, uh, 2013, Mitt Romney sworn mm -hmm. in as the President of the United States. What do you say? What, where is the country and where is it headed? <laughs> well, I mean, if he's, if he's, if he, if Mitt Romney becomes President, we will have a slew of budget policies soon after the you know after the president the new president is sworn in or in you know the next the next uh, the next inauguration the country will be confronted with a series of budget issues you know essentially congress has been putting off uh, this debate for several you know now a couple of years and the country really can't put it up any longer so because we're going to face the expiration of the bush tax cuts and we're going to face issues uh, something called sequestration, which means that if nothing happens, there'll be massive cuts or significant cuts to defense and uh, just domestic discretionary spending. There'll be a lot of incentives to address those issues. And if Mitt Romney is president, we know what he'll do. He'll lower taxes on the very wealthy and, um, and corporations, and he'll, uh, you know, shred the social safety net. I mean, I, I don't use that lightly. I mean, he would literally, we're looking at quarter, you know, 25% cuts. To and he doesn't care very much about the poor, sir. <laughs> well, those are his words, not mine. So <laughs> um, That's why I quoted him. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, these are significant budgetary items, and I think, you know, but Cap's role will be to continue to put ideas out there for, you know, progressive leaders. You know, our best work has been actually in uh, when Democrats had, you know, were really out of power in Washington, and we were able to put ideas out there um, that essentially Democrats could come around and, and, and win elections ran down the road. So, Talk about the Republican Party, and, and I guess what we have to characterize, it's assault on women, or it's war on women. Well, and clearly, if you look at the latest poll numbers from, mm -hmm. for example, the ABC Washington mm -hmm. Post poll, there's a huge gender gap. Uh, yeah. And, gender gap. And, and particularly among independent women. What is this? What what is the nature of the war on women, and why why is it happening? Well, it's fascinating. There's been a particular confluence of events that have happened in a short period to really crystallize this debate. Many of which started uh, a year ago. So you know, when the Republicans came into power, most people thought they would work both at the federal level and at the at the state level. Most people folk thought that they would work on on economic issues because a lot of people voted for them on economic issues. I should remind people that, you know, amongst the first votes that the House Republicans took was, you know, abortion-related bills, basically saying there's no funding for anything that could relate to abortion, no funding for Planned Parenthood. In the states, uh, a lot of these new state legislators have worked on new restrictions around abortion itself. So, you know, the issue of um, the, kinds of, the kinds of invasive procedures Virginia would mandate around 
abortion, you know, asking women to have, you know, a vaginal probe. I mean, these are uh, these are new efforts brought on by a, a group of Republicans who claimed that they would work on economic issues. And those division, those debates came to fruition at the same time that the issue of contraception came to board. So uh, with Rick Santorum primarily being sort of the the spokesperson for this really. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't know how to describe it without being extraordinarily negative, almost prehistoric views on issues of abortion. Certainly being a Roman Catholic, looking at what Santorum's saying, brings us back to pre-Vatican II. Yeah, I, I mean, mean it's and, almost like the Dark Ages. And just, just to point out, you know, Catholic voters strongly support issues of access to contraception. Right. And, and, you know, I've worked on the issue of contraception for a very long time, and, you know, we thought of contraception as an area where you could find a lot of common ground and move forward an agenda. And um, I think what the issue of contraception did was demonstrate to women that the Republican Party stands on the opposite side, opposite side of the wall than they do on a series of issues. And um, I think it really, you know, there's a big debate whether it's economic issues or contraception or these whole confluence, but I think where you've seen the biggest movement of voters towards the pre president, it's not just independent women, it's college-educated independent women who thought that the Republican Party was in one place on the issue of where women should be in the society and saw that really the, vo the strongest voices in the Republican Party were on the other side. And I think that really became crystallized when Rush Limbaugh you know, had these horrible, hateful things to say about Sandra Fluck. And Mitt Romney's only response was that, you know, he wouldn't use those words. And it's like, what words would you use to describe a woman <laughs> instead of prostitute who used contraception? And I think you saw, you know, the president, I thought, in a very smart move, called Sandra Fluck and has been making a concerted effort to demonstrate on, on whose side he stands. And it seems to me he's been clear that he stands on the side of America's women. Talk about the economic policies that you would, I mean, you were an advisor. Mm -hmm. What, what, you walk into the, the West Wing, what do you tell the newly elected President Obama? Well, you know, I'm particularly proud of CAP's role in August and September of this year in, you know, working with our friends in the White House and the West Wing to shift the discussion from austerity to jobs. And to, we provided a number of ideas to the administration on jobs that they ultimately adopted and the jobs package they put forward. And you know, my view of this is that the president needs to continually demonstrate that his first, second, third focus is ensuring that America's middle class families are striving and succeeding. And he has to continue to put ideas out there that help shape that debate for them. And so, you know, I think it's not enough to just do the JOBS Act and move on to other issues. I think the president needs to continually focus on those issues. And, you know, real distinction between the parties, again, is that the president has ideas on how to actually create jobs in our economy. And Mitt Romney not only attacks those ideas, but his ideas around re about job growth is literally to just do what we've been doing for a decade, which is to give more tax cuts to the very wealthy and hope it all trickles down to everybody else. You have argued in a number of places, most recently in a uh, New Republic blog, about fixing the tax code. Mm -hmm. How do you fix the tax code? How should the tax code be fixed? Right. Well, I think one of our significant challenges is, as we were talking about earlier, is inequality. And the tax code actually increases inequality in a number of fundamental ways rather than reduces inequality. Obviously, in, in broad swaths, it is progressive. Um, but, you know, we now, after the Bush tax cuts, we have a situation where the number one cause of our deficits is actually the economy. But the second reason, and second primary reason, is the fact that we have you know, the Bush tax cuts. They are actually the biggest contributor. So we need a tax policy that ensures that the wealthy pay their fair share. And, um, you know, that the president's talking about that on the for the Buffett, you know, the Buffett rule that he's been discussing. But we also have to ensure that people over 250,000 pay their fair share of the, of the talent, of the economic, you know, pay their fair share of the budget. But the, but in addition, there are all these ways in which the tax code really helps well-off people through deductions and other things for a number of a number of things from like state and local taxes to charities to other a whole host of the of ways and the 
those deductions in a way actually end up, you know, the more the wealthier you are, the bigger the deduction. So, um, you know, my view is we should convert those to tax credits and you should ensure, you should basically we should look through the tax code and see all the ways it's basically rigged for people who are wealth well off and try to simplify the tax code and uh, and and reorient it towards being more focused on middle class America. But given the the overwhelming and increasing power of money mm -hmm. and the protection of money, revision of the tax code would be the the point at which the fight really becomes serious. Yeah, I, I agree that it's not easy, but you know, my my view is as a progressive, you know, one of the reasons why people are so cynical about government is because they look at a tax code that affects all of us, but really seems to be rigged for people who have lawyers and accountants who can who can game the system almost. And so as a progressive, I think we would have a lot more uh, trust in the wrong government if we had a much more simplified code that was progressive. I, I think mm -hmm. I, I think flat tax ideas are just a way to tax poor people and middle class people and give a big tax break to wealthy people. But we could have you know simplified rates, a much simpler code, and you know people there'd be a lot more transparency around you know what's actually happening in the, in with with the income tax system if you simplified it dramatically. It'd be very difficult. And I shouldn't you know we shouldn't underestimate the what's really happening in our with Citizens United. I mean, what's really happening with Citizens United is that we have a very small number of extraordinarily wealthy people who are basically trying to pick the president. And, uh, you know, I think my my own view is I, I don't think Justice Kennedy, just to return to the Supreme Court, I don't think Justice Kennedy expected that he would have unleashed a system in which more people know who Sheldon Adelson is because he's funding Newt Gingrich's entire campaign, essentially, than who Justice Kennedy is. And I think that is another argument for judicial restraint and deference because when the Supreme Court acts uh, and acts uh, uh, to do uh, to undo legislation and what uh, the judicial, you know, the elected branches have done, without the same level of scrutiny as uh, the elected branches, they can unleash a whole host of problems that they themselves may not have foreseen. You're optimistic? About the court or in uh, the in world? In general, the world. <laughs> you know, I... You got 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, you know, obviously there are a lot of challenges, but I actually think, you know, you're seeing that uh, you know, a year ago, it seemed to me a lot of Americans were turning against each other. But in the current period we're in, it seems to me that Americans are pulling together a little bit. You see in, you know, Boy, am I, I think, glad you're seeing it, because <laughs> I sure ain't, but I'm glad. No, no, but I think, you know, the fact that there has been, just a, a good example of this, is the fact that there has been so much outcry about uh, the Trayvon Martin case, where, you know, people can really feel what it's like to live in another parent's shoes and lose a child. You know, I think that is actually a sign that America, even in the worst moments, we can we can pull together and, and think through, you know, what are the challenges we're seeing and how can we fix them? And my hope is, you know, um, in the early parts of this recession, Americans seem to turn against each other. And I hope as we kind of come out of it, hopefully a little bit, um, Americans will come together. I hope so too, thank you. My thanks to Neera Tandon for being on the show. For more information on the Center for American Progress, go to AmericanProgress.org. Next week, we'll talk with Greg David, business journalist and faculty member of the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism here on CUNY TV. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email, whatever it is. Thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it, send it.